Welcome to the 2023 edition of Trieste Next. I'm Luca, an AI-generated speaker who will presenting our festival. In the next three days, we will be talking about a new world. This is the title of the 12th edition of our Festival of Science. Innovation and Research, the ethical limits and new frontiers of science will be the center of all our events. What will the new world be like? Will we be able to face the challenges of the near future applying new scientific discoveries and technologies in a sustainable way? This will be the underlying theme of Trieste Next, with 100 events in English and Italian, the Science Book of the Year Literary Award, 300 speakers, 70 activities for schools and 40 exhibition spaces that are open for everybody in the city center close to the town hall. Before leaving the floor to our next panelists, I would like to thank all the scientific institutions within the Trieste City of Knowledge Network, the main partner together with our content partners and sponsors for supporting our project. Mostly, thank you to the 200 volunteers who are helping us. I have one last remark for all of you. The next event will last 75 minutes. Our speakers will answer all of your questions in the final 15 minutes. Also, please remember to check the updated schedule of events on our website. Thank you and enjoy our festival. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Myers. I'm a group leader at uh, the International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology. And uh, I am going to give a presentation today about how uh, our institute uh, works with uh, other United Nations on the 17 um, uh, strategic development goals um, that, that they have. the same. We can skip this one. Doesn't seem to be advancing. I got it, I got it. Thanks. Um, so first, a little bit of an introduction about IUCGB or the International uh, Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology. Uh, we're an international organization um, in the United Nations system. Um, and uh, as such, we have our own uh, member states. Um, right now, we have 80 uh, member states, and they can be broken down into um, different groups. Some are just signatory states, which means they just signed um, that they kind of support us. And then we have um, 60 member states, and these are the ones that we're most responsible for serving and um, um, contributing to the development of science um, in those countries. Um, at the moment, we have three main components. Um, one is right here in Trieste in Padriciano. This is the headquarters of the entire organization. And then we have two kind of sister institutes, uh, one in New Delhi in India and another one in Cape Town. And um, if you look at the map, the colored states are either signatory states or member states. And you can see that our, our focus is really on um, promoting science in um, countries that do already do not have a very robust uh, scientific uh, infrastructure. And one of the things you'll notice is that it is not North America, not most of Europe. Um, and so a lot of our member states are from Central and South America, Africa, uh, and Asia. Um, we have a pretty simple mandate, um, which is basically just to provide a, a center for excellence in scientific research. 
um, and training mostly in molecular biology and biotechnology. And um, we are really focused on trying to address the needs of our member states or our member countries. Um, and so this really is a case of using science as a way of um, developing capacity in different parts of the world and also as a way of um, promoting relationships um, between different parts uh, of the world. Um, I should say that we originally started off um, as a special product of UNIDO and then, as I said already, we became an uh, independent uh, organization. Um, as I said, we're responsible to our member states. Um, every year there's a meeting of the Board of Governors which uh, has a representative or representatives from each of our member countries and then they um, provide uh, guidance for um, our future work and they give us um, feedback on what they think is what part of our programs are working and which part of our programs really are not helping them that much. And this can be a little bit difficult because as you can imagine, we have 60 to 80 countries. They each have their own focus and their own needs and some things work really well for some countries or some regions and other things, uh, those things may not work as well um, in other places. So also to sort of give us uh, um, sort of an extra um, 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 an extra area where we can get support is um, the Council of Scientific Advisors and they're really, really important for helping us um, decide our kind of long-term future uh, goals. Um, ICGB is a constantly changing organization. Um, sometimes uh, we add new members, so we recently added um, eight new member countries and I think that there's probably another four or five that are somewhere in the process of um, becoming a member state. And it's actually a pretty difficult thing to become a member state um, because it requires basically a, a treaty to be signed between the country and um, our organization and then this treaty has to be um, ratified by the United Nations. So it's not something that is um, that you can just do because you feel like doing it. Okay, um, and so we're part of the United Nations or within the United Nations system and um, the United Nations comes out with um, what they call sustainable development goals and these are the problems that they think are um, the most important ones that really, really need to be solved in order to um, further sort of the goals of, of humanity. And so originally these started out as sort of five-year goals and then um, a lot of these problems are not things that can be solved in five years, so now they're kind of 15-year um, goals. And I mean, so they cover pretty much all the things that you would think humanity needs to take care of from things like um, getting rid of poverty, making sure people can eat, um, making sure that everybody is sort of treated as a human being should be be treated. And then there's um, more and more things that are um, becoming important due to climate change. So now climate action is an actual goal by itself. Um, but there are other things in here that are basically related to this, um, including um, sustainable food, um, sustainable cities, um, keeping um, the environment um, in a way that uh, things can be, um, um, that humanity can keep basically living on the planet because I mean, we don't have another one. Um, so. My institute basically has six major uh, instruments or six major platforms 
that we use to sort of promote our mandate. And some of these are directly um, responsive to these 17 strategic development goals. Some of them, they're responsive, but in sort of an indirect way. Um, as I said, um, really our goal is to basically promote science um, in our member states. And so one of our main um, instruments of action is to have cutting edge scientific research laboratories. And so this is, um, we have them in Trieste, New Delhi, and Cape Town. And um, one of the things that the scientists uh, focus on is basically setting up collaborations either directly with people in our member states or promoting two different laboratories in our member states to collaborate with each other. Okay, and so um, I guess this would be responsive directly to um, the 17th one is um, developing partnerships to um, fulfill these, these other goals because really the, the problems that the world are facing um, are really worldwide problems and they were going to require a lot of cooperation between a lot of different regions of the world in order to um, solve them. Okay, um, and I mean this is just a slide showing um, a few papers that have been published um, mostly out of the Trieste component, just showing that, you know, we do actually live by this. I, I don't think there are too many papers that we publish that um, do not have scientists from um, our member states as, uh, as a major participant in them. Um, and so the, the laboratories at the different components can be broken up into kind of different um, focus groups and usually we don't separate them um, based on how they are responsive to these different sev 17 goals. We usually separate them based on kind of their, more of their scientific focus. Um, but for this I'm going to try and fit them, fit them more or less into the, um, these 17 um, strategic development goals. And so like the third one is good health and well-being. Um, and so this is basically just sort of uh, medical applications. And um, so ICGB has a, a number of groups oops, that are, are focused either on directly on infectious diseases or non-communicable diseases. And so um, um, in India and Cape Town, we have a, a large focus on parasitic diseases. Um, and these can be everything from um, malaria and other kind of uh, protozoa parasites, tuberculosis um, and stuff like that. And then we have a number of groups that are also working on virology. And so typically this is, now there's a large focus on COVID. Um, but there, in the past, there's been focus on dengue, Zika, um, and um, emerging viruses like that. Um, for non-communicable disease, non diseases, um, this is mostly uh, cardiovascular diseases um, and cancer, um, but there are focuses on others, uh, other uh, non-communicable diseases. And um, one of the issues that the world is facing, although it's not a direct, directly mentioned in the strategic development goals, is that by and large, the world's population is getting older and older and older. And so like, it's very rare for me to be in a room full of mostly young people. I'm usually they're, I mean, usually they're my age or older, so it's pretty rare that I'm like the oldest person uh, in the room, um, and so typically what that means is that there's going to be an increasing almost epidemic uh, problem with diseases of old age. So for example, heart disease is typically something that manifests itself as you get older, 
Um, the neurobiology labs typically focus on neurodegenerative diseases and cancer. Um, there's typically two points in your life where you're at risk for cancer. One is when you're young, so like childhood leukemia and stuff like that. And then as you get older, your risk for cancer increases and increases. Um, yeah, and so um, besides just um, medical biotechnology, we do also a lot of sort of what would be called like agricultural biotechnology. And this addresses sort of the, the second strategic development goal of the United Nations, which is to kind of eliminate hunger. And um, most of the focus at ICGB and sort of the agro-biotech um, sector is basically developing plants um, that are either more nutritious um, or are resistant to things like um, drought, uh, salinity, which are sort of like non-pest based um, problems for the plant, as well as developing um, novel approaches to take care of like insect pests and other kinds of um, things that actually eat and attack um, the plants. I was actually surprised about um, how important this uh, part of developing a more nutritious crop plants is because one of the things that most people don't realize is that the plants that we're eating today are less nutritious than the same plants that our parents ate. So a, a tomato that you would eat today is less nutritious than basically the same tomato that you would have eaten 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago. And that is completely related to the fact that, you know, the, the um, parts of the earth where you can really do like kind of industrial scale farming, like where you can really efficiently produce wheat and tomatoes and lettuce and stuff like that is sort of stagnant, right? It, we're using basically all of that that we can use right now. And so basically what's happening is we're, over time, we're depleting the nutrients out of the soil, so less nutrients end up in the plants. So there's a, there has to be a way of um, making the arable land that we have now more productive and sort of not just producing more of the same crop, but producing um, nutritious crops as well. Okay, and um, um, this is mostly done in um, the component in New Delhi, although we do have um, a plant group in Trieste and uh, one in um, Cape Town as well. And as I said, um, it's either broken into sort of this crop improvement group, which as I just talked about is trying to make more nutritious um, uh, crops and um, a, another group that is base, another basically section um, where um, they're trying to make crops that are resistant to biotic or abiotic stress. So biotic stress is things like locusts and grasshoppers and caterpillars and things that eat the plant, um, bacteria and fungus that attack the plant, and abiotic stress, and that's like drought and salinity. And so, um, one of the issues with the arable land that we have now is um, the increased amount of drought and salinity that you're seeing largely because of climate change. So um, increasingly, uh, because you know, the, we're, we're, the world is getting warmer, so the arable land actually needs more water to produce plants. And so before when we were dependent on Rainwater um, 10 years ago, that was probably fine, but now because there's increased drought in most places, um, that isn't enough. So now we're using a lot of irrigation. So we're either pumping water out of um, the ground or we're using river water and stuff like that. And the main difference between using like um, 
water that you pump from the ground or from river water versus rainwater is the river water and the, um, the underground aquifers tend to increase the salinity of the soil. So there's dissolved minerals in that water. You pump it onto the, the land. The plants use some of the water, some of it evaporates, and what's left in the land is salt. And so although the water that you're putting on there isn't really salty, because you're putting that water on all the time, right? That small little bit of salt builds up, builds up, builds up, builds up into the, um, into the soil until you get to a point where, oopsie, wrong button, until you get to a point where um, that land no longer can produce um, crops at the same level that it used to. And there's really, really the only solution for it is for a lot of rain to come down and start washing that salt out which typically isn't gonna be a problem. So I, I know that there are people working on uh, rice and wheat and sorghum and a whole bunch of other crops to, to make them um, resistant to these sort of abiotic stresses, which are gonna become really, really increasingly important as um, the climate change advances. Okay, um, similarly, you know, uh, one of the United Nations goals is to um, develop affordable and clean energy. And um, basically this is anything that you can get, you can do to get away from being so dependent on fossil fuels will, um, will meet this goal. And so um, ICGB has a number of groups that are working on um, developing cost-effective and, and viable biofuel technologies. And so this is either developing um, new sources to make things like biodiesel. So for example, there's a large group that works on um, using microalgae to produce biodiesel. And so the nice thing about this is you, it, for as far as carbon, um, being dumped in the environment is basically a zero sum, right? The, in order to make the diesel, the microalgae has to fix carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, it makes, it converts it into an oil or a fat, and then that gets converted into biodiesel. It gets burned and releases CO2 back into the environment, but that ends up balancing out of from the CO2 that it had fixed in the first place. Um, that's one area where ICGB is working and there's also an area where you try and take uh, a waste product of an industry and you try and convert that into uh, basically fuel. So th this is typically done by um, using bacteria or fungus or something else to ferment that waste product. If you do it aerobically, it might produce methane or ethanol or something else that then can be used for, for energy purpose. And that way you're, although it's not carbon neutral, I mean, you're, um, you're basically using something that would just be a waste product. Um, and so there should be, and there should be a net gain um, from that because otherwise typically the waste product is burned and you get nothing from it. Um, Yeah, so this is just the groups that work on the sort of the biofuels and um, converting uh, the waste products into something more useful. Okay, the, uh, so th that is basically just kind of the summary of like the big things that are being done either here in Trieste or one of the other um, ICGB components. Um, and our other instruments are sort of more at um, developing the relationships either between ICGB and our member states or between laboratories within our member states. Um, and so one of our big um, pillars is supporting um, um, advanced fellowships for PhDs and postdocs. And so these can either be um, a full fellowship for the whole time you're a PhD student, um, a two or maybe three year postdoc, um, or they can be short term, a couple months to a year, um, either in one of the ICGB components or in an, 
an, another lab in a member state. Um, and so the idea here is we want to train sort of the next generation of scientists. And so one of the issues, especially when ICGB started, was you know, these sort of technologies were developed mostly in the US, Germany, the United Kingdom, to some extent Sweden and Switzerland. And if you keep things with the status quo, then those are the places that are going to have the technology and nobody else is going to have it, right? And so that sort of goes against this, one of the strategic goals, I don't remember which one, about uh, limiting inequality. So um, there's two reasons to do this. One is that it, you know, it's just not right for really important game-changing technologies to be held by a few countries. Um, it gives them a super duper advantage. But for me, the other big problem is if you do things that way, what problems are gonna be solved, right? You're gonna solve America's problems and you're gonna solve Europe's problems and the rest of the world, what's gonna happen? Not very much, right? So if America can feed itself and Europe can feed itself, then, you know, um, what is Africa supposed to do? You know, America is gonna make the kind of GMOs that make people mad, right? The kind of GMOs that make people mad are, I'm gonna put a pesticide resistance gene in my crop, right? I'm gonna plant it everywhere and then I'm gonna spray pesticide everywhere. Every other plant in the world is gonna die except for the ones that I put the resistance gene in, right? And it's, it's sort of done that way, um, partly because it's quite effective, but also because um, it ensures a profit um, um, cycle for whoever developed that crop, right? Typically, the guy who develops the crop is the same person that sells you the pesticide. So, I mean, they, they get your money twice, once when you buy the seeds to plant the crop and then once when you, you do the pesticide. And, and th that's not the problem that they have in places like Africa and Asia. The problems that they, or Aus even Australia, the problems they have there are, you know, the problems with abiotic stress and biotic stress. And, um, you know, you're going to have to wait until there's a huge problem in the United States for them to develop those crops that then can be imported into um, other places. Whereas if those scientists in those places have these technologies, they can start solving their own problems right now. I mean, I just read a grant about um, date palms, right? So there's a pathogen in date palms. And so if you're in the uh, Middle East or certain parts of Asia, date palm is a really, really important crop, right? It's incredibly important. It's like olives in, um, in the Mediterranean. I mean, it's like really, really an important food source and it's used for a lot of other, other things. If, if I hadn't read this grant, I wouldn't know that they had this problem, right? Because I'm so far away from it. But for them, it's really, really a critical thing. And so for, to train the scientists in those countries so they can use these techniques to solve their own problems is, is, makes everything more efficient, I think. Okay, these are just the announcements for um, the fellowships. I think we accept um, f uh, applications for PhD fellowships um, only once per year, but for the other fellowships, we um, accept and evaluate the, the application three times per year. Um, some of these fellowships are focused on specific groups to um, fix um, specific problems, and these are usually done with uh, the cooperation of other funding agencies. And so like um, we have this PACS program, um, um, which is f to set up collaborations between some of these um, 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 some of the, the, the poorest countries um, in the world. And um, this is done between um, the United Nations and TWAS and, and us as a cooperation. So, I mean, this is a, 
important way for us to basically fulfill um, three of these strategic development goals and with one program. So we, since this is focused on medical um, issues, it fulfills number three, which is good health and well-being. It's a fellowship program for educating people, so it hits number four. And then it, there's a partnership between us and other international organizations and the partnership between the fellows and whichever lab um, they end up in. Okay. Um, yeah, so almost everything about ICGB is set up for number 10. Right, it's really to reduce the inequalities in scientific capacity or capability, especially in the biotech and molecular biology sectors um, in our member states, right? And um, this is, uh, and so it, we, we tend not to just look at, you know, people from the member states as one group. I mean, because we, we also tend to, to try and and adjust for, for gender equality, inequality. And in science, technology, engineering, and math, I'm sure everybody here knows that there is a big gender inequality. There's typically more men in the field than, uh, than women. And um, luckily, that isn't as extreme in, in biotechnology and molecular biology field. There's typically closer to 50-50 representation. And so like when I was um, looking through these slides, I went through and I looked at all the um, PhD students that I've trained and 60% of them have been women and only 40% have been men. And I wasn't trying to fix gender e inequality. It was just these are the people that came with interest in the field. So I think that because Biotech is sort of a more goal-directed field. You know, like you have a problem, you want to solve it. I think it appeals equally as well to men and women, whereas a, a, a field that is more just, I don't want to say intellectual, but more abstract, where there isn't like a physical result that comes out, uh, maybe it only appeals more to men. I, it could be, I don't know. Um, and so we have some fellowships that are, are designed just to address sort of gender inequality. So we have this Empower Fellowship, which is for South-South um, mobility. I'll talk about that later. Um, but it's basically just so for women in our member states can go from a lab in their home country to another lab in another ICGB member state. skip this one and um, we also have this uh, we start um, fellowship which is focused just on women in Africa and um, this is a fellowship program um, in um, basically any of our scientific uh, areas of expertise where uh, women from um, Africa from our member states in Africa can come to one of the the labs in ICGB. Um, these are typically um, short-term fellowships, but we do offer long-term ones for um, PhD students as well. Um, so right now, uh, we have about 427 fellows um, that we're supporting either at ICGB labs or in other labs in other member states. Um, and I mean, we even have um, some um, fellows that we're supporting in countries that aren't member states like the United States or other European countries, simply because of the expertise that they're looking for. It may be only offered in one or two places in the world. And if it's not offered in one of our other member states, then they have to go somewhere else. Um, okay, so like the, the fellowships um, can be either long-term ones or short-term ones. And I'm going to talk about 
one of the short-term ones, which are these SMART fellowships. And so these are, are short between one and 12 months. And this allows a, a person to um, go to another lab in another um, member state. And so this really is set up to promote collaborations between um, labs from our, our member states. So it's, it's not uncommon for, you know, um, somebody in Argentina to want to do a fellowship in, let's say, Mexico or even farther away in South Africa or somewhere like that. Um, and um, it really begins to build a sort of a network of scientists that can um, collaborate um, to solve their, their own problems. Right, and so this is sort of this um, south-south mobility. Um, I don't know if you would noticed in the first slide um, that I showed, I mean, the equator basically is running somewhere around here, right? And really a, a lot of our member states are south of, of the equator. And this is sort of something that people have noticed for a long time that, you know, the countries north of the equator typically are more developed than the ones, not all of them, but it is a general rule than the ones that are south of the equator. And so this south-south mobility um, is basically focused on um, those sort of, um, uh, to, to build the capacity in the, in the, in south of the equator, basically by having the best labs in the in the regions, helping um, the less um, the less developed labs in the region, and that way the whole region will um, basically pull its, itself up. Right. Um, also, in sort of the education um, realm. Uh, we organize meetings, courses, workshops, things like um, like we're doing today. Um, and I, I forget how many meetings we do a year. It's typically around 100. Um, it depends on um, the, the, how much funding we have and how many applications we have and how expensive the meetings are predicting they're going to be. So it, it varies from from year to year, but typically, I think we have like a hundred different kinds, a hundred different events. Oops, wrong button again. A hundred different events, and these can be um, courses that are designed for typically um, PhD students or postdocs um, to give them a certain skill. So there's a new technique that's developed. Let's say gene editing. And so we've had, I don't know, since in the last five years, we probably had two or three courses in different member states just on gene editing. You know, somebody wants to do gene editing in plants, so there'll be a course on gene editing in plants. Somebody will want to do gene editing to address problems with cancer, so there'll be a one just for gene editing for, for cancer therapies and stuff like that. Um, or they can be um, meetings that are focused on a single subject. And so they're less about sort of like a, a course where people are coming to learn something. This is a sort of a meeting where the people with expertise in that field are coming to basically share their latest results. Okay, and so we try and videotape every seminar that's given at ICGB. Every course that is given, we try and get the course organizers to film every presentation that's being done. And then we create a, basically a library of seminar and podcast programs that you can get on YouTube or different, um, different platforms. Right, and so right now there's more than 900 
um, movies, and it uh, includes scientists from over 80 different countries. So this is really a resource that anybody who ever, we don't charge money for, you don't have to register for it. You basically just have to, to look for it, find it, and then all that content is there for you to, to peruse as your curiosity takes you through a random walk of whatever um, floats your boat. Um, we also offer editorial services. So English is my native language. Almost all scientific dis discourse now is done in English. But if English isn't your native language, th that can be a really, really big hurdle because you may even be able to speak English relatively well, but scientific English and the way a scientific paper or a grant needs to be organized and the way things need to be presented um, is, is um, very technically, um, requires a high level of sort of technical knowledge of, of, of how that is done. And so we offer editorial services for people who maybe they need help with getting a paper published or getting a grant submitted to um, a funding agency that only takes um, applications in, in, um, in English. And one of the things that I've noticed is there's also a lot of like sort of cultural differences as well that, that play a role in this. And so the like American funding agencies typically are looking for something a little bit different than let's say European ones, right? And um, if you're not coming from a background and you don't understand the subtleties that are involved in, in that kind of difference, you can really put yourself at a disadvantage. Okay, I said all of that. Um, we also do a lot of sort of public outreach, like this would be considered an example of, of public outreach. Um, we also have another, a, a whole bunch of other platforms. Um, we have Science in the City, which is sort of similar to this. It's focused really at um, kind of school age children, I guess from uh, elementary through high school. Uh, we offer Foldoscope workshops, which are a a fairly highly uh, high-powered microscope that's basically made from a couple lenses and paper that you basically fold up to make a, a microscope and it's powerful enough where you can see single cells, you can see nuclei, you can see cell division taking place. It's really a, a nice kind of, a, of project that we've been promoting mm, I would say probably for five years now. Um, and then we have a program of, bio, of um, kind of seminar series in Africa. Um, we have our internal seminar programs. Uh, we have a school program um, in Cape Town and we have one here where um, we basically give tours and kind of uh, demonstrations to elementary and high school students um, in our labs. Um, okay, I think those are the important ones. Yeah, so like I said, um, we've been doing a lot with uh, foldoscopes. We've been doing them in here in Italy, in Africa, basically anywhere that will let us will basically show up and um, uh, basically introduce foldoscopes. So here's one right here you can see, right? I mean, it, it starts off as like a little packet this big and then you, you, you fold it up and you, you end up with a, oops, you end up with a, with a microscope that you can, you can actually use. You can see them, I was gonna say this, you can see them, I don't know how many they still have to give away. <laughs> because I think yesterday was the day where all the school groups came through and I was talking to John Duca this morning and he basically said that, I don't, I don't think they have very many left to give away. <laughs> but it, I mean, if you want to see them, I mean, they have some that you can go there and play with. Okay. Um, in addition to 
all of this stuff. We also provide um, research grants for scientists in our member countries. And this goes back to something I said before, where you know I only know the problems that I know. I don't know the problems that other people are having in their home countries. And so this gives them an opportunity to basically uh, get funding for their own research for the problems that they think are important. All right, and um, these are basically called CRPs. Um, and because one of the, the things that makes for us, makes a grant really competitive if there's some level of collaboration in them. Uh, it's typically not a collaboration with an ICGB lab. It's typically a collaboration with another lab in a member state. So if you have a great research project, but it's just you by yourself in your lab, you have a chance of it getting funded. But if you have that same great research project, but it's you and a lab in the neighboring country and a lab maybe in another continent far away, then you have a much, much better chance of, of, of that project being funded. Um, yeah, so it, it supports uh, research in laboratories, member states. Um, it funds consumables, equipment, um, any extra personnel you need, and a small bit of travel so you can go to a meeting and present your results. Um, there are different kinds of CRPs. There's early career return grants, for example, and, and this is sort of meant to kind of reverse what's called the brain drain. So typically, if you're from um, a less developed country and you want to be a scientist, you're likely to leave, right? You're likely to go do your PhD or your postdoc in a place like America or Europe or another country that's um, more developed. Um, and so the early career return grants are aimed at supporting these scientists when they go back, right? So this is a, a I think it's the only funding uh, program that I know of that is really focused on just taking people who've left their country to be trained and, and sending them back and giving them resources where they can start their lab and basically hit the ground running. Right, and so, I mean, I think these are the ones that are currently being funded right now. So there's like 102 projects that are being run right now. We've been running this program, I think, for 30 years now. So, um, um, and, and these are the, the countries where there's an ongoing um, CRP. And so we, we try and focus mostly on um, the quality of the science, right? But we try and keep track of where we're funding and countries that are applying for funding and maybe aren't, um, aren't getting funding from us, we'll take a look, a special look at those grants and we'll see if there's something that is, uh, that can be easily fixed that will make those grants more competitive. So like oftentimes um, uh, a country will, they'll, they'll maybe apply for six, six people from a country will apply for a CRP, right? And so like, let's take, I know that like Cameroon, we usually get a lot of applications from Cameroon. And a, a lot of them are uh, looking at or looking for um, pharmaceuticals from their native plants, right? And typically all of them are, I'm in my lab, I have these plants, I'm gonna grind them up and throw them on whatever problem I want, right? But then you'll get a grant from a guy in the same institute, wants to do the same thing, right? Maybe on different plants, maybe throwing them at a different, the extracts at a different problem. And because they're trying to do it all by themselves, it's a little bit weak, right? If they would say, look, we're gonna collaborate together, 
right? Or we're going to collaborate with a guy with, from Nigeria with different plants that wants to throw them at the same problem, then that becomes a much stronger grant. And we can go and we can say, look, you guys have been failing lately at getting funding. Maybe, look, we've noticed that you're not doing a lot of international collaborations in your grant. Maybe that's one avenue you can address, make your grants more competitive, and you'll be more likely to get funding. Okay, um, like I said, we've been doing this program for a long time. Uh, we've had more than 600 grants funded. Um, I think now we're over, this slide I think is from 2022, so now we must be over 30 million um, dollars funded in 56 of our 60 member states. And this has supported the publication of more than 1,400 papers. So this has really, really been a successful program. Um, for us. Okay, we can skip this. Okay, so we're still moving down our six instruments of action. We've done the, the research grants and we also do um, technology transfer um, between uh, technologies that ICGB has developed to uh, to our member states. What's the time? Okay. Um, this one has also been incredibly um, successful for us. And so um, it's basically run by a couple of groups at ICGB. And um, basically the idea is that if there's a pharmaceutical that's what's called a biopharmaceutical. So it's something like insulin or interferon, which is a protein that your body makes to basically solve a problem that your, your body has. Um, you can make that, purify that, and then you can use it as a medicine, right? So it's different from like a small molecule drug like aspirin or something like that. It's actually a, a protein molecule that it has a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical action. Okay, so basically the idea is we will try and make those um, biopharmaceuticals in a way where the means of production and purification can be distributed amongst our member states in a, with a mechanism that's called technology transfer. And um, so this is basically done mostly by the biotechnology group um, and so the idea is that as soon as a biopharmaceutical comes off a patent, you can begin to start trying to make it, purify it, um, so it can be used as kind of a generic version of, of that molecule. And I mean, I think there are five or six that have been um, pretty well accepted um, in our member states, although we offer um, the ability to do more than I think just these. Right? This is the most important part I think about it is if you make it yourself, purify it yourself, put it in little vials yourself, right? The cost per dose becomes uh, something that most countries can now afford, um, afford to do. Like, we won't take interferon alpha, which is like one of the most popular biopharmaceuticals. It's used mostly for people with arthritis. But I mean, uh, a, a dose um, costs uh, like $30 if you were to buy it in the United States. If you make it yourself, uh, it costs 1.5 cents. Right? I mean, so that's a massive, massive, massive savings. And that's not even the biggest one. I mean, uh, interferon alpha 2b is 136, it becomes 12 cents, right? Uh, GCSF, $1,650 if you have to buy it, uh, $7 if you make it yourself, right? So this, this takes medicines that are basically could be beyond reach for most people into basically affordable medicines. 
Okay. Um, now, the because of the importance of this, the the, the unit has kind of expanded its uh, goals, um, and uh, in addition to providing the um, sort of the technology to do this, they're also going to start providing um, the cell lines that produce um, these compounds. And the important thing about this is they will be done, it'll be done in a kind of a good manufacturing process, which means the member states can take that vial directly and start producing the, um, the compounds without having to go through a whole bunch of regulatory um, problems. Okay, so um, we'll skip this. We'll skip this. Um, and so this is not, in addition to doing this sort of biotechnology for biopharmaceuticals, um, we have a group that is basically trying to use um, um, the microbes that grow alongside plants in the soil or um, on the surface of the plants as a way of producing um, fertilizers or uh, pathogen resistance in sort of using it as a biocontrol kind of agent. Um, we can skip this. Yeah, um, and so again, like one of our core values is um, um, that science builds partnerships, so almost everything ICGB does um, also fits into this um, goal of fostering sort of international co cooperation. Um, and um, we have a number of different projects that are, are designed basically just to enhance uh, know-how uh, um, and co collaboration um, between um, different countries, so like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has basically been promoting uh, this biotechnic project which is basically focused on helping um, countries in the Horn of Africa. Okay, we can skip this. Um, using sort of our philosophies, we've also um, been um, trying to establish a rapid kind of diagnostic programs for COVID-19 um, in our member states. And um, the important thing about this is this technology can also be used or adapted to any new emerging pathogen that, that shows up. And so again, this is a, a way where these countries can start solving the problems that they have. Yeah, and so these are sort of my summary slides of the way that the different things that we do kind of indirectly impact uh, some of these sustainable development goals. So like nothing here that I've talked about really directly impacts kind of like poverty on a societal level, but all of these things that we do have an indirect impact on this. Right, and some of them, um, not just poverty, but other ones like peace and justice require a whole bunch of these other things to be, to, that we do actually directly affect um, um, to be mitigated. Okay, I, I think this is my last slide. Uh, just once again to say that like ICGB, uh, our main goal is to promote science um, basically for development and the kind of development of capacity as well as sort of developing relationships between um, different countries. Okay, thank you. I just woke everybody up. For the research grant program, uh, do you normally found uh, only research institute or also company or 
I don't know, maybe startups or other kind of institution? Um, usually we only fund directly to like sort of academic institutes or nonprofit institutes. Oftentimes they will have a commercial partner um, because um, like besides like big pharmaceutical companies, like a lot of like startup biotech companies are coming out of a university or a place like ICGB or something like that. So there is usually a, an academic lab that's behind there. And so then there can be some sort of collaboration between um, that academic lab and whatever that, that, that startup is. But typically like if a company writes to us and says, well, I want a grant to do this, they typically don't have much chance. Um, we do fund some research projects from kind of unexpected places. So like I think we have a research project I think from Egypt that comes from I think one of the city's uh, water purification plants. And so they want to basically develop something similar to the technology that we have for um, detecting COVID to basically look at water samples for different pathogens. So, I mean, that isn't technically an academic institute, but it's also not really a for-profit kind of thing. So I think like for, like strictly for-profit, they would have to be collaborating with somebody. You have one yes. uh, thank you for the lovely talk. I wanted to refer to the part where you stated when high tech is limited to specific countries, then there's a status quo and the benefit would be limited to the countries possessing the high tech. So what is ICGB's uh, strategy to transfer technology, high tech that they're developing in their member countries to reach outside the member countries and for the other countries to be equipped with the tech themselves? Um, it's, we're kind of really beholden to our member states, right? Because our, our member states, they basically pay for all the activities at, at ICGB. And um, so the way that it would work would be, you know, <clears throat> if, if, if you're a member, if you're a lab in a member country, right, and you get like a CRP, right, you can use that CRP to hire somebody who's not in, from the member country, right? And so this is something that in, in the CRPs, there is a section on training and who they plan on training and how they'll be trained. Um, And we do hold meetings and conferences and we visit countries that aren't member states. But as far as like offering a fellowship, uh, so I mean we're limited by our bylaws it is that like if we're gonna pay a fellow directly, like it has to be somebody from a member state. But like I said, if somebody has a CRP, and they're in Egypt and they want to hire somebody, I'm trying to pick a, <clears throat> like they want to hire somebody from uh, Morocco, which isn't a member state, they can do that, right? But um, our hands are kind of tied by our, our bylaws and in, in, in what we can do. But I mean, we try and, uh, we try not to be like, super rigid about it, you know what I mean? Like we had a, uh, a student who wanted to come from Nepal, right? And at that time, Nepal wasn't a, a member state. I mean, we figured out a way where we could support him without violating our bylaws, and, and now Nepal is joining ICGB. So, it, I mean, we, we recognize that we cannot be uh, super rigid about it and that there is 
helping, <coughs> sorry, helping a country that isn't already a member state is a good way of introducing them to ICGB and maybe getting them to join in the long run. So, I mean, I guess I would say probably the correct answer is we try and get them to join ICGB and then we can, they can participate in all our things, but. Thank you for the talk. I came here with several students from United World College. Um, my question is, um, you have a really very nice outreach program, but what we are interested in, is it possible to send some of our students for a short period of time to join a group in ICGB and learn? Uh, because we have some students who are really, really very up to science. Thank you. Um, I, I don't see why that would be a problem. I think the only issue would be is uh, we would have to know, right? I mean, so, I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but I mean, uh, like, if my neighbor's high school student wants to learn how to do something in a lab and they, they come to me and I say, sure, come on, and then I, I don't tell ICGB, Right, and I just let them in my lab and I teach them how to do an experiment or whatever. Um, that, that is something that cannot happen, right? Because if they get hurt or um, something bad happens, then, I mean, the liability insurance won't pay and if the police find out, we could get in trouble for having a, a minor who's not employed and blah, blah, blah. But I think that if you come to, to you, to Suzanne in the back. Uh, that is something that I think would be really easy to set up and probably would be uh, something that would be beneficial for us as well. So, I mean, I think that if, if the one message that I could give you is we're here to help people in our member states and all you have to do is come ask us and we may not be able to help you in exactly the way that you want, but we'll, we'll do our best to, to figure out some kind of a, a way of, of solving the problem. How would you say that the ICGB makes sure that the research conducted by member states are recognized on an international level? Sorry, I didn't get the question. How would you make sure that the research conducted by member states is recognized on an international level rather than just within the ICGB? Um, we typically look at two measures. We look at sort of publications, how many publications, where they're published, uh, how many other people cite those publications, those kind of typical uh, that's sort of like the general measure of all science and all scientists everywhere in the world. Um, and the other measure we would look is like uh, labs that we've supported, like how well are they able to get funding from other agencies besides us. And I, I, I know that like one of the things that we really like to hear is like if we give somebody a CRP, and so a CRP, or like one of our research grants usually runs for three years, and so what we really like to hear is at the end of like three years of support, we like to see that they have some publications, but then we usually reach out to them a year or two years later and we, we want to see like how, I mean, when the funding stopped, did the, the science stop? And one of the things we want, we really like to see is if they've gotten funding from somewhere else to continue that project. Right, and so if, if we start somebody off and we give them that push, right, and if, they, if then they can go out and get funding from somewhere else, then for us that's successful, you know. Okay, I think we can stop. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, 
Uh, the booth for ICGB is um, in the long tent closest to the, on the side closest to um, the city hall. Okay, thank you, thanks again.